morning and welcome to the live radio broadcast of New Baptist Church located at 61028th Street in Huntington. We'd love for you to join us this morning at 11 o'clock for our morning worship service. Either if you could get out of the house, you could come here or online at newbaptistchurch.com. We also have Wednesday evening services that start at 6.30 with a um, special Awana and youth group that starts at 6 o'clock for the kids um, from high school on down. Will you join us as Carl leads us in prayer? Good morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the time you've given to us. We can come to your house. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for many answer prayers and given to each one of us, Lord, as we... Continue to live your li life the way you want us to live and to be a witness to those who don't know you and be a light to shine upon those who don't know you. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the time you've given to us. We'll come to your house. Be with Pastor Robin as he brings a message this morning. Be with our special music, Lord, that everything do, Lord, glorify your name. Our Heavenly Father, just, just remember those in the homes and the hospitals and nursing homes, where they may be, Lord, that you would just touch them in your special way. Our Heavenly Father, just be with our leaders of this country, and that they look for guidance to you, Lord, that, to make sure that the, the the right response needs to be to glorify you. Our Heavenly Father, just watch over us and guide us as we walk daily with you. We'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, our special music this morning is Lisa. much Lisa <clears throat> for great piece of music no it doesn't matter how many times you hear it it's always good to hear that piece of music now our message this morning is Pastor Robin oh and it is good to be with you again today let me again welcome you to the radio Bible class of New Baptist Church it's our privilege to share this with you each week uh, we are glad you're here. I want to thank uh, Denver Stevens for filling in last week. I was uh, I was really under it. I called him on Saturday night, last minute, and asked him if he could uh, take care of Sunday morning. He said he would, and I certainly appreciate his willingness to do that and the lesson that he gave last week. Uh, <clears throat> also, let me just say, if you don't have a church home here in the Huntington area, let me invite you to join us at New Baptist for worship. Uh, Again, at, 10, uh, at 11 o'clock each uh, Sunday morning, 
and we do live stream that service. Um, and uh, we're located at 610 28th Street. Uh, that's uh, behind uh, the uh, oh, St. Mary's uh, Urgent Care there at 28th Street and 5th Avenue. So just come on uh, back. You'll see the church back there. Uh, on uh, today, we are going to continue uh, to pick up where I was two weeks ago. Uh, we started a series of lessons from uh, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Uh, and in that first chapter, uh, Paul talks about who we are uh, and what, has, uh, what God has done for us when we follow Jesus. He says that we are uh, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. We are called to be holy and blameless, that he's made us his child, he's adopted us as his children, uh, that he's uh, redeemed and forgiven us, that he's given us uh, wisdom and prudence, the ability to apply that wisdom to life, uh, that he's uh, placed the Holy Spirit within us as his guarantee of our inheritance, and that the same power he used to raise Christ from the dead, he's placed in us. That's all in chapter one, and it just sets the stage for chapter two, he talks about all of those great things, and then uh, we come to chapter two. So if you have your copy of God's Word, you might want to open it there uh, to Ephesians chapter two. We'll get there in just a moment. But let me ask you something uh, as we begin. Have you ever gotten a diagnosis that you thought was hopeless? Uh, but some kind of miracle happens and what seemed to be hopeless became hopeful. As a pastor, I've seen this more than once. I've been with people receiving hopeless diagnoses of cancer and other diseases. Some received miracles and some did not on this side of heaven. But I know a little bit about this. Our oldest daughter was a senior in her senior year of college. Uh, and understand, she was a West Virginia State swimming champion. Uh, as a freestyler and a backstroker. Uh, she went to WVU on a scholarship and she was a Big East champion. There in her senior year, Becky and I had moved to, to Michigan uh, that summer. Uh, we were there and uh, in the late October, we get a call from Ruby Hospital telling us that our, they had found a tumor on Sarah's adrenal gland and surgery was necessary and should be done immediately. Well, Becky and I, uh, we thought we would, you know, we got that word about 10 o'clock at night. I thought, well, we're tired, we'll go ahead and sleep and then we'll go drive to Morgantown in the morning. And uh, we laid there for about 15 minutes and then said, we're not gonna sleep. So <laughs> we got up and drove to Morgantown, we got there. It took about two weeks for the surgery to happen because of all kinds of different things. But in the midst of that, uh, we were talking with the surgeon. And on the uh, day before the surgery, he brought us into his office and he showed us the MRI of the tumor. It was pitted and rough, just looked awful. And then he gave us his diagnosis that in his experience, all of that indicated that the tumor was cancerous. I can't tell you how hopeless you feel when they tell you your daughter has cancer, a cancerous tumor, hopeless. I can't change it, can't do anything about it. Were we scared? A little bit. The day of the surgery came. Surgery was about five hours long and finally the surgeon came out, called me and Becky and a couple of our friends who went with us. And um, truth is, those of you who know me know that, that blood and stuff doesn't bother me except when it's on my own family. Uh, just begin to talk about that stuff and I'll just drop, I'll, I'll pass out at the drop of a hat. So we had friends who went with us and we sat down and the surgeon looked at us and he said, I don't know what happened from yesterday until today, but the tumor that I removed is not the tumor 
that we saw on the MRI. The tumor that I removed was smooth and gave, and he, then he said, and I will tell you that in my experience, I am just certain that the tumor is benign. Now he didn't know what happened, but we certainly did. You see what had been hopeless in one moment, a miracle happened and then it became a helpful future. We experienced that. What seemed hopeless was now hopeful. And I might add to you just as a side note that maybe other than forgiven, Benign may be the sweetest word in the whole English language. But with that as a background, let's move to our scripture for the day and see if you can identify these same elements, that hopelessness, the miracle, and the hopeful future. Starting in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, <coughs> Paul writes these words, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love for with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward Christ Jesus. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and it's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Pray with me. Father, I give you thanks for your word and for the way it challenges us. God, I thank you for its truth. Now, I pray that it would do its work in us, that we would see ourselves, the world around us, that we would respond to the miracle, and, oh God, we would live a hopeful future. Now, do your work in us. It's our prayer, and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, Paul gives this hopeless description of life without Jesus. Now, and notice, he doesn't condemn. He doesn't call the people immoral. He doesn't point a finger at them. He simply describes their condition. He says this, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Trespass comes from a word that means to slip or to fall. <coughs> It's used uh, for failing to grasp or slipping away from the truth. Taking a wrong road when we could have taken a right one. And then there's the word sin. Sin there is a shooting word. It means to miss the mark. Shoot at a target, missing it. Failure to be what we ought to be. What we could be. And then he begins, and we look at the effects of sin in our lives. The effect of sin in our lives, it kills our innocence. We are never the same after we've sinned. Once innocence is lost, it cannot be recovered. Sin kills our ideals. It sears the conscience. Sin becomes easier and easier the more we sin. Sin kills our will. At some point, we cannot keep ourselves from doing those things we know we shouldn't. We become a slave to our desires. Now again, look, 
at the characteristics that Paul used in that passage, just as we walk through it. He says they, that, they, that those without Christ live a life in the way of the present age in the course of the world. The current trend, so to speak. And in the church, it seems to be, to take the clear teaching of Scripture and to bend it to fit the current cultural morality. In fact, the Pope recently said that same-sex marriages should be blessed, celebrated. Now, he's getting some pushback on that. We as Baptists, though, are not immune. We've continued to have division over the issues of, homo of human sexuality and biblical, of, of biblical morality. Our Methodist friends have just suffered a great rift over the sim similar issues where we try to take some, try to take the teaching of Scripture and bend it to fit cultural norms when we ought to be taking the Scripture and bending our norms to it. But just think for a moment. Chastity isn't realistic, so we have to offer some kind of alternative. But it's not just in sexuality, though, is it? Self-centeredness, the all about me, these are rampant. Do whatever it takes to get ahead. Your feelings are more important than truth, so follow them. On and on we could go, but you get the picture. We become slaves to our culture. And Paul says that's just normal. That's all those who are living without Christ, that's all they have. That's the only God that they have. And he says that it's a life lived under the dictates of the prince of the power of the air. The spirit forces that are set against God are influencing the world around us. Just look around, you can identify some of those uh, the, some of those evil forces that are clamoring for our attention and clamoring to become commonplace in our world. Think for a moment about the media, about music and films and TV and how much of it has a darkness element to it, a dark tint to it. We are living under the dictates. But then he goes on to say, it's a life characterized by disobedience. Take our own way rather than God's way. By nature, we are disobedient. We just are. It's just, we just are. For instance, let me say, if I tell you right now, don't you dare think about a red-faced monkey, what are you doing? You're thinking about a red-faced monkey. Now, I know you're saying, but you put that out there, and I could, I heard it, and I had to think about it. I said, well... Okay, but let me ask you this. How often are you told you cannot, should not, will not do something, and your first thought is, hmm, wonder how I can do that and not get caught. Wonder how I can do that. Oh, no, you can't. Well, yes, I can. I remember the Dennis the Menace cartoon where he's being disciplined by his mother. Told him, go sit in the corner with his nose in the corner to go sit there and the next bubble over the next frame said, Dennis sitting there saying, I may be sitting on the in outside, but I'm standing on the inside. We're disobedient by nature. But see, it's one thing to think about a red-faced monkey, <laughs> but it's quite another to live in disobedience to Almighty God. But then he goes on. It's not just disobedience. He says it's a life which is at the mercy of desire. Now think about that. The desire for the wrong and forbidden things, our own appetites control us. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 27 says this, the eyes of man are never satisfied. Always wanting more. They want the next, the newest, the fastest. We're like that. I have to admit, I'm like that when it comes to my electronics. I look at my computer and I think, 
Well, that's a year old. That, that's ancient. I need the newest, fastest, quickest, betterest. And my wife just looks at me and shakes her head. You see, because when I bought it, it was already ancient. Because technology is changing it quickly. But the eyes of man are never satisfied. Never said, always want more, 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 more. We become slaves to our desires, to our appetites. And Paul writes and simply says, that's the life of those who don't know Christ. That's the life, that's all that they have. So, and I think kind of on the backside of what he's saying is don't be surprised when they act like that. We shouldn't be surprised when people live the way Paul describes. It's all they've got. But then he goes on to say that they live according to the flesh. You see, there are, we have weaknesses and there are risks in those. We have weakness in our body and there's the risk of sexual sin, the weakness in spiritual things, and the risk is pride. We have a weakness in, in desiring earthly things, and we have unworthy ambition. We have a weakness in our temper, and the risk is our envy and strife, anger. You see, those kind of things build up in us when we live according to the flesh, when we live what we want, when we want it, how we want it. When we place ourselves at the center of all things, and many of you, no folks who think the world revolves around them. And you don't want to be like that. And yet what Paul is writing here, he simply says, that's what they have. That's what feeds them. They have no other source from which to draw. Anything that gives a sin a chance and remember, we choose to sin. No one or situation can make us sin. They simply give us the chance. And we choose to sin or not. You see, I hear so many people say, well, that person just made me so mad. No, they didn't make you mad. They simply gave you the opportunity to be mad. No one can make you sin. Well, you just, well, no, I do know. We choose. We choose. But the problem, though, for those who are not following Christ is they don't have any help. It's human nature to live out the desire of the flesh because there's no other option without Christ. And then he finishes up by saying that they have a life deserving the wrath of God. A life lived this way before God deserves his wrath and nothing else. And we see the temporal effects of that being lived out in our world today. But then we come to verse 4. <laughs> Here, hear it. Hear these, the miracle. Listen to it. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. But God, but God being rich in mercy. Now, folks, that's a mighty big but. But God, and that's the miracle. God loves us in our current state. He's merciful to us in our current state, being dead, he said. But no longer dead, but alive in Christ by faith in Christ. Raised up and played in a place where God will show us his kindness and grace. We're no longer slaves to sin. No longer slaves to our own desires. And think about how God addresses the issues of sin in us. Although sin kills innocence, Jesus brings forgiveness and removes the guilt associated with the loss. Now, even Jesus cannot restore our innocence, but he can take away the guilt. 
He awakens our hearts. We're never the same after Jesus comes into our hearts after we've been saved. We have new power to live life as God intended it to be lived. We don't have to be the same anymore. He goes on to say that Jesus revives and restores our wills where we once were powerless. Jesus, through his spirit, gives us power. He re recreates our will and allows us to walk by faith. And then we come to that hopeful future. Listen to word again to the words. And it's a future not based on our own performance. Starting in verse 8, he says, but For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one can boast. You can't earn it. And you certainly don't deserve it. But by God's grace through faith we are saved, made his children, and it's his gift to us. Think how miserable heaven would be if it was filled with people talking about what they did to get there. Well, I did this, I did this, I, all puffed up and walking around. They'd look at me and say, man, you just got here by the skin of your teeth, didn't you? <laughs> and I'd laugh and say, oh no, not by the skin of my teeth. I got here by the blood of Jesus. But, but I just want you to know, how miserable would it be? And so God says, it's not about, it's not on you, it's on me. You can't earn it, you don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you through faith in Christ. My future hope is full because God is at work in and through me. I begin to live out the truths we saw in chapter 1 of being blessed with every spiritual blessing, being called to be holy and blameless, being adopted as a child, being redeemed and forgiven, having been given wisdom and the ability to apply that to life, having the Holy Spirit living within me and giving me the power of God, the same power he used to raise Christ from the dead, to live life as he and intended to be lived. That's what I begin to have. That's the hopeful future. I begin to live out those truths. And then Paul completes this hopeful future with the words of Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are God's workmanship, not your own. You are created in Christ Jesus to do good and not evil. This good God has prepared in advance is tailored just for you and for your personality and your life situation. He doesn't ask you to be me. He doesn't ask you to be anybody else. He has prepared this for you. You are his workmanship. Understand that you are unique. You're his workmanship. He has you where you are, doing what you're doing, so that you can honor him with your life. We are to walk full of hope in this good that he has prepared for us. Now, does that mean that tough and sad and ugly times won't come? Not at all. Not at all. They will for each of us. But we're not left to face them alone. God's Spirit empowers us to face any situation to live out the good that he has prepared for us. And there it is. That's it. God answers our hopeless situation with a miracle of grace and a hopeful future empowered by his spirit. Pray with me. Father, I give you thanks for this day and for your word. Oh God, help us to experience a miracle and a life full of hope and to be removed from a hopeless situation. Now let us do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.